who we have lost along the way, who we continue to be fighting for. So as we join here together, I encourage everyone to take a deep breath. Give yourself permission just to be. Just to be. This is a gift. Your presence is a gift. I thank each and every single one of you for giving that gift to yourself, giving you, giving us that gift of your presence, being in community here to mark this journey that we are all on together. My name is Kristen Urquiza. I am the co-founder of the nonprofit Marked by COVID. It's an organization that I co-founded with my partner, Christine, a few days after my dad tragically died from COVID-19. The mission of our work is to help create space to lift up stories of loss so that we can continue to humanize the numbers. These are our loved ones. These are our friends. These are our community, community members and their lives mattered. We're also working to ensure that we have a coordinated data-driven response to this pandemic so that no more needless and preventable deaths happen. Over the course of the last several months, I have met so many amazing people, which has really filled a cup of hope that has felt very, very low. Um, today, we are going to focus our space on centering around communities most impacted by this virus. We are going to hear stories about folks in black, indigenous and people of color communities that have been lost who are disproportionately bearing the brunt of this pandemic. Not only are folks in the BIPOC community more likely to contract the virus, they are more likely to pass away. These are also the people that tend to be on the front line, whether it's in hospitals, as uh, physicians, physician assistants, respiratory technicians, folks in the cafeterias, janitorial buildings, ensuring that these institutions can run to care for us. These are also the folks who did not have the privilege to Netflix and chill during the shutdown. These are the people that were in the fields day in and day out, ensuring that our fruits and vegetables were delivered to the grocery store. They were also in the grocery stores and still are in the grocery stores, ensuring that our families can be fed. There are so many ways in which this beautiful community is ensuring that our country continues to run and yet we are not giving them the decency of existence and life. Today, we will center our grief around the incredible sacrifice that this community should not be making at this moment. In addition, we are going to be centering our thoughts around the elderly. These are our parents. These are our grandparents. These are people that have done so much to raise us and build this country and yet we have cast aside. These people are not expendable. These people matter and it is our duty to protect them as they protected us when we were children. So today we will bear witness to the impact this virus has had on these most impacted communities and allow ourselves a moment together to remember, to honor, and to commit to never forget so that this will never happen again. I'm so honored today to be joined by two inspirational women. My good friends, 
Dr. Kioma Aruha, Aru, excuse me, and Rabbi Erica. Um, Kioma will, in a few moments, share with her, share with all of us the incredible impact this has had on her and her family. We will then afterwards together say the names of some that have been lost. And then we will turn it over after our moment of silence to Rabbi Erica to wrap us up with some reflections, prayer, and healing. So thank you again so much for joining us. Um, feel free to write your name and where you're from um, and what brings you here in the chat box um, so we can get a sense of who you are. And as I pass it over to uh, my good friends to take it from here. I just want to say once again, thank you. Thank you so much for giving yourself permission to be here, for allowing yourself the opportunity to 100% be present. If you are angry, be angry. If you are sad, be sad. If you're grateful, be grateful. Allow yourself to experience whatever it is that you're feeling right now, because it is the truth and it matters. And there is no wrong or right way to be in this moment other than just being. So with that, Kioma, I'd love to invite you to take the proverbial microphone. Um, you know, thank you so much, Kristen. I just first wanna say thank you for your courage, for your voice. Your voice is resonated. You are doing you know, God's work, <laughs> you know, no other way to put it. So thank you. Again, my name is Shioma Oru and uh, COVID has hit my family in different ways, but most tragically, the loss of my father who is still watching over me. I feel him around. So I, I feel a mix of all the things you said, Kristen. I feel grateful. I feel angry. I feel sad and tears don't come when I want them to come. So they may just explode and then go away. And so that's just how it goes. Um, but my story is very common to, to our community here. We're in loss together. My father was, uh, has been sick for many years. I'll say that pre-existing conditions. He had dementia, he had cancer. He survived that. Um, he had aspiration pneumonia, which is why he was admitted into the hospital in February. And we, uh, he survived that from the ICU. But uh, so much hospitalization in such a short amount of time, he was losing physical skills. So we sent him into uh, a rehab facility after being discharged from Georgetown Hospital. So he could get, regain his skills and be sent home and get the home ADA compliant so we can serve him. In that time when we were trying to figure out the next best care, my dad contracted COVID. Ironically, my brother, who was a cop in Virginia, my dad lived in Maryland, um, got COVID uh, earlier in April or late March, early April, right before my dad was admitted for COVID. Um, he was in the ICU, survived, thank God. And a week after we were celebrating his survival from the worst moment, my dad was then admitted into the hospital. We didn't have contact with my dad for two weeks because there just wasn't the opportunity. Um, they were figuring it out. We asked for a video, we asked for FaceTime, we asked, you know, so could I send an iPad? They said there'd no, be no guarantee to get it to him or to manage it. And because he had dementia, he couldn't really care. He'd need direct support. And it was a time they were all trying to figure out, we were all trying to figure out what was going on. So um, within those two weeks of them figuring out how to give us communication with him, he had rapidly dec declined. We had asked, could he be on meds? Were they trial drugs? They said the state of Maryland hadn't approved drugs. And in any case, my father was 76 and high risk and they, didn't, they weren't confident that the negative side effects from those things would result in positive results and were actually may lend to further complications for him. 
So we only had but to wait. They gave us two options. They said that, you know, we could, you know, take the oxygen off, um, not intubate when it got really, really bad and, and let him go naturally, or we could fight to the bitter end. Well, we're a family of fighters. My dad was a fighter. And we knew what he wanted us to do, as hard as it was, because we knew he would be in physical pain right down to the last minute. And the irony of the whole drug situation that's triggering for my mom who cries every day to sleep since she found out that President Trump had COVID and got the best treatment possible, got access to trial drugs that we couldn't have for my dad. It's so triggering. It's so triggering. And we said goodbye to him on Zoom. <laughs> Say goodbye to him on Zoom and we will never be the same. Physically with my brother who survived COVID and now has to go to dialysis three days a week. We pray that he doesn't lose his kidney. And, uh, and if he does, you know, he's alive and we're just grateful. We're grateful to God and all of creation. My mom contracted COVID she was in ICU. Oh, she didn't make it to the ICU, thank God. She got the plasma treatment, which seemed to be positive in results for her. And uh, now has to, uh, well, now she, she's in recovery. There's some long-term things we're watching neurologically. She's, her depression is really disturbing. She's doing odd things. So we're watching her closely. We don't know the long-term effect. We're all impacted. I'm impacted emotionally. And I was saying like grief is something that I'm taking my time with. I, you know, I, I do struggle with depression and anxiety pre-existingly. So I'm on watch for my mental health. So all of that intersects with everything that's happening right now. And so I do what I do best and that's take action. That's advocate. That's give voice to those who may need to lean on me that's lean back and watch people and help people the best that they want me to help and serve. So thank you, Kristen, um, for this opportunity to share my family's story, to join hands to what we are called to do. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much, Chioma, for being the leader that you are, being the warrior that you are and keeping your father's memory alive for not only his well-being, but for the broader community. Um, it has just been, you inspire me. You inspire me. And I thank you so much for you showing up the way that you do in every single space that I've seen you in. So thank you. Um, we are now going to... Uh, take a moment to reflect upon some of the folks who have been lost uh, with a small slideshow presentation that we've put together. As we are getting that um, shared on the screen, I just want to uh, start with the first person that we'll be honoring on the slideshow will be my dad. Uh, my dad was Mexican American. He was 65 years old and died on June 30th from COVID. A big part of the reason why I'm doing this work is not just because my dad passed away. I think that's reason in and of itself, but because when my dad got sick, the people in his community my childhood community, the place where my mother still lives. We're waiting upwards of 13 hours in line to just get a COVID test. My dad lived in Arizona. Arizona at the time had the highest per capita cases in the world. My childhood neighborhood had the highest per capita cases in Arizona. That means that where I grew up had the highest per capita cases in the entire world. This was not happening in February or March when we didn't know and we weren't prepared. This was in June. 
This was after the state of Arizona had taken time to shut down and apparently get ready for a surge. You won't be surprised to learn that my childhood neighborhood is 70% Latino, mostly immigrant, folks living on the margins, the very exact same people who were part of the skeleton crew of the Arizona economy, who once Doug Ducey decided to reopen in a cavalier way, which was like turning on a light switch, pretending like we had been on the other side of the pandemic. These were the people who contracted the virus and died. I knew that if I didn't speak up, who would? I also knew that if I considered myself a person who carries racial justice deep in my heart and soul, that if I didn't speak up, that that value would just be performative. And so part of what has driven me to be this voice is to honor my community and to shine a light on the fact that people like my dad, people like Chioma's father, people like our grandparents are shouldering in this pandemic and dying. And so I would love to just share with you this happy picture of my dad. The sparkle in his eye is part of his soul and I will miss him for the rest of my life. And so today we honor Mark Urquiza. We also honor Tessie Henry, who I unfortunately didn't have the opportunity to meet, but she lived here in San Francisco where I'm based. Um, she was a beloved grandmother to her own grandchildren as well as the broader community. And we lost her at 83 years. Clifton Ned, another um, gentleman from San Francisco. He was a restaurant owner with his wife for the majority of his career. Uh, he was, it was told to me that he um, made the best catfish in the entire city of San Francisco. And we lost him at 82 years. Hasty Yasukochi was a proprietor in Japantown in San Francisco. Uh, she owned a sweet shop that was beloved to the broader community. And we lost her at 80 years. Lorena Borjas, we lost in Queens, New York, 59 years young. She was a trans right and immigrant activist. We will never forget her. The Reverend Vicki Gibbs was also needlessly lost to COVID. She was a beloved reverend in Houston, Texas, a giant in her community. We will never forget her. And Kimora Lineman. She was a child of nine years old. Nine years. We'll now observe a moment of silence.
Thank you. Please participate, continue to participate, show up tomorrow. We will be honoring the World Mental Health Day. So we'll be uh, centering around um, mental health. Um, feel free to uh, tag week of mourning, marked by COVID, mourn out loud on social media. One action that folks have been taking this week is um, sending out a picture into social media that's of an empty chair of their love, that their loved one uh, sat in that is now empty. And then for other ideas on how to participate and be involved, go to weekofmourning.com. I have seen some of the most beautiful displays of public mourning um, from a incredible floral vigil in uh, New York yesterday, co-hosted by Fiona Tulip of our community to an arts um, and music gathering in Phoenix, hosted by Tara Krebs in our community. There are incredible ways to get involved and I encourage you to do so, give yourself permission to do that. Um, so to close this out, I'm gonna pass it over to um, my good new friend, Rabbi Erica, um, to um, offer up some reflections, uh, prayer and healing. Thank you. Well, um, thank you, Kristen and um, Dr. Chiama. Um, I wanna, it's, it's really inspiring to be with two amazing women who are taking actions to, to try to make this world better with all the brokenness. And um, Dr. Chiama, I wanna say um, how awesome it was a few, a short while ago when you openly acknowledged that you've had anxiety and depression. I wanna say thank you because there's so much stigma in many different communities. So like every African-American, the Jewish, you know, there's probably with lots of minority statuses and different, we know my minority mental health carries a lot of stigma and just in general in the country. And Kristen, thank you for making tomorrow a day where we acknowledge it. But um, I don't know if you remember not that long ago, um, former first lady, Michelle, Obama acknowledged, she said, I, I don't remember the exact quote, but I think she was interviewed and she said that she was dealing with low grade depression just in general because of everything that's going on. And so whether you've had pre existing um, mental health, and I, I also have anxiety and depression that I live with, everything is compounded when we're in a global pandemic and when we're seeing the injustice of, of how. Um, leadership has failed and, and just how resources are allocated. And so it's hard, I think, for anyone to be fully um, well internally. So I, I just wanna thank you for acknowledging that because I think the more we can normalize it, the more we can support one another and hopefully help people get connected. And um, so I, I want to begin by sharing what I think is a beautiful prayer. It's, it's, it's a poem called Prayer by another, another human being who um, changed our world for the better by her being part of it, the late Maya Angelou. So I'm first going to read it. These are her words. Father, Mother, God, thank you for your presence during the hard and mean days, for then we have you to lean upon. Thank you for your presence during the bright and sunny days, for then we can share that, that which we have with those who have less. And thank you for your presence during the holy days, for then we are able to celebrate you and our families and our friends. For those who have no voice, we ask you to speak. For those who feel unworthy, we ask you to pour your love out in waterfalls of tenderness. For those who live in pain, we ask you to bathe them in the river of your healing. For those who are lonely, we ask you to keep them company. For those who are depressed, we ask you to shower upon them the light of hope. Dear creator, you, the borderless sea of substance, we ask you to give all the world that which we need most, peace. Uh, 
I, I, I've been blessed to work with um, uh, in a skilled nursing community that has a nursing home and a rehab facility and assisted living. The average age is 87. And I've been there for over eight years. And I, I'm there because I love working with older people. I, 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 every encounter is an opportunity to be blessed with learning and um, being connected to history, the experiences that they carry, the lessons they've learned and, and the strength. I, when this pandemic began, I had this really interesting epiphany, a realization. So social distancing measures were taking place. And I was really worried for the residents in the nursing home. Their families were not gonna be allowed to come in, their friends, they weren't able to come together in large gatherings. And I was thinking, what, this is not gonna be good. And at the same time, young and people outside of residential communities, those of us living independently, were also experiencing social distancing. What surprised me, and this is early on, was that the older folks in the nursing homes, they were handling it better than the younger people. The younger people who were so used to everything going okay are taking so much for granted, taking the ability to just move about in life as much as they want. We're not handling suddenly restrictions, whereas people who are already removed, already set in another area, already limited in their mobility, they understood that this needed to be done to protect other people. They got the understanding of sacrifices to personal sacrifices to protect other people. They had also lived through World War II, for instance. And um, when I asked them, was this something that they'd ever experienced? And they said, no, not even World War II. Um, so their, their strength, their resilience was something I was so inspired by. But as this has gone on, and as Kristen said, by June, there is no, no excuse for for where the country was in June, let alone where we are today. But as this has gone on, and as Dr. Chiyama also talked about, the impact of the virus, so I'll get to the people who have died in a moment, but just on the people who, who didn't even contract it, but who've been living in isolation, and, and, and I'm talking about older people who are already marginalized. And so for many of us in society, we don't think about our elders, who be, they're out of sight, out of mind. The isolation, the lack of socialization and contact has impacted people cognitively. I've seen cognitive decline just in their, I've seen people who now seem to have dementia that did not have it before. Um, and, and of course, mental health. And I, and I think there are people who have died because of the loneliness, people who are so social and who so depended for their well being on physical contact with loved ones and, and other people that they, the, the lack of being able to do that led to their death. So I'm grateful for the opportunity to, to shine a light on these remarkable human beings that are gifts to us and who can add so much to our lives through stories and teaching and intergenerational connection is, is I think, so precious. And there are cultures and traditions where elders are honored. And there's the reality that there are people who require assistance for everyday living, who cannot live at home, even if their loved ones really wanna care for them. And there are people who are not so old who are in nursing homes. Maybe it was a car accident or a stroke, or they have MS. There are all sorts of things that can happen in life that we don't plan for that limit our ability to live independently and, are, and we need assistance. And so nursing homes are needed, but our society has not valued the importance of having fully staffed and equipped nursing homes. So when the pandemic hit, there, there was a shortage of safety supplies and there was all sorts of problems in getting the resources to these really essential places. So I, um, I wanna thank you. And um, there's, there's so much more to say, but I, I want to, to pause with that and, and transition to, to talking just a moment about the grief of, of losing loved ones. And um, I sadly have now known and lost too many residents. They've died because of COVID. 
And as I said, I've known others who have now, who won't be the same because of the consequences of either surviving or just being part of a community devastated. And also just watching the news, they've, they've seen how devalued they are. They, they heard the governor, the Lieutenant Governor of Texas say older people you know, can die to save younger people. They heard that, they felt it. Um, in Judaism, there's a tradition when a loved one dies that we tear our clothing or, or nowadays you may see a black ribbon worn and it's worn over the heart. And it's an external symbolic representation of the tear in our hearts, the tear in the fabric of our lives. And I think everyone probably on this call has a heart that's been torn and maybe more than once. And, our, and the fabric of your life, the fabric of my life, the fabric of our lives as a country has been torn. And it takes time. And one of my prayers, and I say this when I'm with people who are grieving, and I do believe this, is that we pray that with time there's healing, that we'll never, our hearts will never be the same. There's gonna be, we, we pray for mending, but it's never going to be the same. We pray for healing of that fabric, but it's never going to be the same. But each person, it's going to take time. And, and we were chatting before the start of this call saying that the, the scale of the grief, the scale of the tears, I don't think we can fully grasp at this moment. As individuals who have lost people we love, I think if we fully felt the, the pain of that loss and, and the anger for it, that it didn't have to be this way and we would just collapse. And as we're saying here and we're committing and affirming, we aren't gonna collapse because we are also gonna be part of the, the change and the solution, but the grief and the pain is gonna be ongoing. And so I pray that we are compassionate with one another, compassionate with ourselves and understand that there's no one right way to mourn, no one right, right way to, to, um, to grieve that, Kristen, what you've created is, is so special. Many of us have not had time because we've been on the front lines or we've, you know, we've been working or there's so much to distract us that we haven't had space and we haven't had community because we're not going into our places of worship or we don't feel safe to, to be vulnerable, to, to maybe let some of those feelings out. And thank you, Kristen, because you have created a safe container where people who didn't previously know each other can be intimate and vulnerable and, and the presence of love of God, whoever, whatever the holy higher power is that you feel connected to, or if you, if you find that power in other people or in nature that we bring all of that into the space because we need it and we can affirm. So I want to, and I want to share with you um, a prayer that was written by, um, a woman who, who, died, who lived with chronic illness for a, a, a while, her name is Debbie Friedman, and uh, she wrote a prayer for healing. And in, in many synagogues nowadays, this is included, this prayer for healing. And where I work, where, which we actually have a synagogue, it was the history of the community goes back over 160 years. Um, and we, spiritual life is important. And I, I believe it's an important part of our well being is taking care of our spiritual well-being along with our mental health and something i've learned and we say this in all of our services is that even when there's not a cure for a physical illness there's always i believe an opportunity for some sort of healing whether it's physical emotional psychological spiritual relationship and let's face it Relationships are complicated and people may have lost people who they loved or had difficult relationships with unfinished business. And, and I, I do believe that death doesn't end your relationship with your loved one or whoever it is you're connected to. Your relationship stays, it changes, but death doesn't end it. And so we can even pre pray for continued healing if there's unfinished business for you with loved ones you've lost. Um, so this is a prayer for healing and I really, my hope is for all of us who have broken hearts and tears in our lives that we, we hold on to the hope that healing is possible and that we, and I, and I also firmly believe that love, 
love is a very powerful force for healing. And I will tell you, when I lead the residents who are, you picture a room full of people in wheelchairs and walkers, and you may look at them and think they are frail and weak. They are the strongest spirits. And when they pray for people they're thinking of, and they think about people around the world, they'll pray for when there's a national disaster or, you know, and we're praying for COVID people all over the place. They're sending love. So I invite us all to, to send love. I mean, I, the anger is also important and there's a lot of hate out there and that is not good for, for health. So I, um, there's some Hebrew, the English, there's some Hebrew, but the English explains what I'm saying in Hebrew. And I'm not a professional singer, but I do like music. And so I'm gonna share with you this prayer. Avotenu mekor habracha lehimotenu may the source of strength who bless the ones before us help us find the courage to make our lives a blessing and let us say. Amen. Mishaberach imotenu mekor habracha lehavotenu. Bless those in need of healing with refuah lehima, the renewal of body the renewal of spirit, and let us say, Amen. May there be healing and love and strength for us all. Amen. Amen. Thank you both so much for joining us today. That was beautiful. Thank you to everyone else in the audience for joining us today and holding this space. I feel your love. I do. We will be meeting together again tomorrow at nine o'clock. And until then, be kind to yourself, be kind to one another. Thank you. <laughs>